All right, my name's uh, Professor Bob Hill. I'm the director of the Environment Institute at the University of Adelaide. I'd like to start by acknowledging the Kaurna people, the original custodians of the Adelaide Plains, and the land on which the University of Adelaide's campuses at North Terrace, Waite and Roseworthy are built. Thank you all for coming along to tonight's Research Tuesdays event called Mission Mammal. Being National Science Week, it's only fitting that we have four talented scientists here tonight to lead us through the discussion. They're going to talk about Australia's huge variety of mammals, the threats that face some of them, from climate through to disease, and how research at our university is working to help them. Our panel for this evening includes Professor Chris Helgen, the Deputy Director of the University's Centre for Applied Conservation Science. Chris has worked professionally in over 50 countries and documented and named dozens of previously overlooked living mammal species. He's also a former curator of mammals at the Smithsonian's National Museum of Natural History in Washington, D.C. Dr. Liz Reed is a research fellow in the university's School of Physical Sciences and a member of the university's Environment Institute. Liz is also an honorary research associate with the South Australian Museum, a member of the Society of Vertebrate Paleontology and a former site interpreter at the Narracourt Caves. Dr. Wayne Boardman is Senior Lecturer in Wildlife and Conservation Medicine and Veterinary Biosecurity in the School of Animal and Veterinary Science. Wayne is a former Head of Veterinary Services at the Zoological Society of London, Senior Veterinarian at Sydney's Taronga Zoo and Head of Veterinary Conservation Programs at Zoos South Australia. And finally, Chelsea Graham is a PhD candidate in our School of Animal and Veterinary Science. Her research is an interdisciplinary project conducted in collaboration with the Adelaide Medical School, focusing on conserving the Tasmanian Devil. She's been awarded grants from the Nature Foundation of South Australia and the Sir Mark Mitchell Research Foundation, as well as recently receiving the Hans Jürgen and Marianne Off Research Grant. We're going to start this evening with a presentation from Professor Chris Helgen. Following this, all four speakers will be sitting at the front of the stage for a panel discussion. And later in the evening, we'll ask you from the audience to ask some questions. So let's get the night started. Thank you, Chris. Great. Thanks, Bob. Good. Thank you. I'm going to release uh, our panel guests to, so they can see the screen. I'm just going to speak for a few minutes and, and get us started on Mission Mammal. So thank you for everyone joining us this evening. How's that mic? Can you hear that? Great, great. Well, let's get started. Um, what we're going to do tonight is showcase mammal-related research that's happening here at the University of Adelaide. And so we've titled this uh, Mission Mammal, and I'm going to give you um, a little bit of a background. Now, a basic question, what is a mammal? Everybody, uh, sometimes when I put this to a classroom, everybody says, well, they think for a minute, well, a mammal has fur or it has, it's warm-blooded, it has a four-chambered heart. Many things come to people's minds, but at, at the core of the definition of what it is to be a mammal is milk. All mammals are fed by their mothers on milk. It's that aspect of lactation that unites all of us on the mammal family tree, so that um, that uh, root mammal from the same, comes from mammy, mammary, the breast, comes ultimately to the same root as the word mama. So all of us mammals, we come to, to this earth sharing um, this aspect of, of motherhood and being raised on milk. So that is what is, it, it is to be a mammal, and I want us to uh, remember that unity that we all share. So I've been lucky in my career to work, in mammal, work on mammals as a researcher all over the world. Going back almost 20 years, working on animals, researching animals like lions and other large animals in Africa. And my work is, uh, uh, especially as a taxonomist, from my earliest days I've been fascinated with how to classify animals to understand the richness of life. How many kinds of species are there out there? How can we tell them apart? But also much of my research all along the span of my career has been focused on conservation. The world is changing. It's more and more of a human world, less room for wildlife. How can we understand wildlife and mammals in particular in order to conserve them? And so I've studied animals like uh, rare tree kangaroos in places like uh, New Guinea, West Papua, Papua New Guinea. 
I've studied animals like this one, the Olinguito, which was uh, an animal that uh, we discovered as new to science and named just a few years ago that went on to become an emblem of cloud forest conservation in the northern Andes, the countries of Colombia and Ecuador. Um, also studied animals like tigers, uh, in, in this case a camera trap picture taken from Burma, from Myanmar. Uh, and I focused my efforts on what we call often the mega diverse countries. These are 17 countries highlighted on the map, just 17 of the several hundred uh, nations in the world that all together within those green borders account for the grand majority of global biodiversity, the richness of all life, whether you're tallying up plants or frogs or birds or mammals, these are the countries that are richest in terms of nature, natural heritage. And Australia obviously is one of them. I know we have a radio audience tonight. If you look at this map, you see countries that are especially tropical or subtropical, countries that are, are big. Uh, and in our part of the world, that's uh, Australia and some of our neighboring nations like Papua New Guinea and Indonesia and Malaysia, the island nation of the Philippines. It also includes India and China. In the Americas, we see that it includes the United States and Mexico and countries that uh, harbor the Amazon and the Andes like Brazil, Venezuela, Colombia, Ecuador and Peru. And finally in Africa, we have uh, Madagascar, South Africa and the heart of Africa, the Congo. So this is something to think about too. These nations, um, Richest in biodiversity, they include also um, the principal superpowers in our globe, um, some of the richest nations in the world, some of the most important rising nations like Brazil, South Africa, India, uh, Indonesia, etc. cetera. Uh, and there are many links to think about between the richness of nature and all other aspects of society and economy. So these are, these are the areas where mammals too are at their richest, where I've centered my studies and today, I'm going to focus, of course, uh, as a, a group, we're going to talk mostly about one of these dear to all of us, which is Australia. Australia is a land of iconic mammals, as you well know. And uh, it's easy, perhaps, living in Australia to forget how incredibly emblematic of Australia as a nation and as a continent some of these animals are. Instantaneous recognition across the globe of our unusual mammals. This, of course, is the only part of the world where you have all three of the major flavors of mammals, including monotremes, the egg-laying mammals like this platypus. These are Gould's images. Marsupials like the koala and the kangaroo that instantly, no matter where you are, whether you're in Central Africa, Russia, anywhere else, you uh, talk about these animals and people know you're talking about this country, about Australia. So we shouldn't forget how uh, incredibly um, you know, ambassadorial these creatures are, that the mammals of this nation are for us, and uh, what, it, what that might mean in terms of our thinking about giving them a fair go, giving them their due. This is also a country uh, where some animals have become emblematic because of extinction and endangerment. This is one of our most incredible Australian mammals, which has now uh, been missing from the continent for quite a few decades. Uh, what an extraordinary creature that was. And others, too, uh, are, are endangered. Dozens of animals are so endangered in Australia that we're worried about their demise uh, over the next year, years, five years. We have uh, concerns that some of them are becoming extinct. Um, some of them have become extinct on our watch over the last few years, like the Christmas Island pipistrelle, a small bat. Um, but um, across this Globe, uh, global span, again, looking at these green nations, Australia again stands out. So most of those nations haven't recorded a single mammal extinction, or if they have maybe one or two, maybe three, uh, in the last 500 years, despite incredible encroaching development, large human populations, etc. South Africa has lost one to global extinction. Brazil, none. Madagascar, a few. The United States of America, a country with a lot of similarities to ours here in Australia, uh, has lost three marine mammals and those going back quite a few centuries. Australia, we've lost about 25 species of mammals and a lot of them have been in recent decades through the 20th century up to modern time. So this is a land of great uh, natural wealth but also one of extinction. 
So here we come together tonight here at the University of Adelaide, and uh, we've picked a group of researchers who are all people that I love personally working with and talking with. And we're going to hear a conversation about this. We could have picked a number of others. The university uh, is a center for many different kinds of research that are relevant to mammals, especially things like genomics, genetics, ancient DNA, ecology, and conservation. Uh, but tonight we're going to hear from a range of folks. And it's worth remembering when we think about Australian mammals and some of the uh, expertise we have at this university that globally they are so unique. About 90% of all mammals found in Australia are not found anywhere else. And those that are are usually just found in places like New Guinea and Indonesia. Uh, and we have mammals here, again, that defy all the other rules of being a mammal. And so learning about mammals here means sometimes relearning the rules of biology to really understand how some of these strange creatures work. And fantastic animals, the echidna, uh, platypus and echidna uh, uh, are some of my favorites. So who are we going to have speaking with us tonight? I want to introduce a little bit more Liz Reed, who is a paleontologist. And she uses as a, her tool set the fossil record to try to understand in broader context how Australia has changed and its wildlife has changed too. And so Liz is someone who studies mammals from the smallest mice up to the largest creatures that roamed this continent until recently. And so we're going to hear from her perspective. You see here very sort of studiously, industriously um, excavating a cave. This is more how I usually imagine seeing Liz, though. She's a, a caver, and she's got her helmet on there exploring. We're going to have Chelsea Graham. Uh, who is a PhD student. I myself did a PhD on mammals here uh, coming on 20 years ago, and it's exciting uh, to invite another student here that's at the forefront of important mammal research to talk to us tonight. She's going to be speaking about uh, her research in particular on devil facial tumor disease. How many have heard about devil facial tumor disease in the audience? Most people, almost everybody. This is an important national wildlife issue, and we're going to get some updates on that tonight. And I know that Chelsea is someone who uh, does some amazing work in the lab that you're going to hear about, but is also at home, like I think the rest of us are, with hands-on uh, hands mammals. And we're going to hear from Dr. Wayne Boardman, who is a uh, noted researcher in the veterinary field. And he's going to be talking to us about a range of projects, including on some of our urban mammals here. Those have become in recent times most familiar to us in Adelaide, animals like koalas and fruit bats, flying foxes, uh, that have uh, become uh, part, of, part of Adelaide's very fabric. So there's Wayne, again, happiest maybe when he's got his hands on the creatures. So that's an introduction. Why don't I invite our panel speakers down to the stage, and hopefully we can take flight and have a conversation. Come, come on, sit down, please. Give them a round of applause as they set, uh, settle in. So great. Uh, we, I'm going to uh, get us started, and we're going to talk about uh, mammals amongst ourselves. And then uh, once we've talked for a little while, as Bob mentioned earlier, we'll open up the floor, because I know that uh, we have a lot of uh, uh, people who have brought their questions here. And, and we have great turnout from the public here, uh, but I also know we have other um, fantastic researchers in the audience as well. Well, Liz is right next to me, and I might start uh, posing a question to you, Liz, um, which is, I, I talked a little bit about uh, the richness of life and particularly the uniqueness of Australia uh, and the problem we have of extinction. And it's something that, you know, in terms of a modern environmental ethic is something that concerns us greatly. Uh, but you work on uh, a, uh, not just a snapshot of the modern, but a view that encompasses a much deeper perspective. And I was wondering if you can open up and tell us a little bit more about your research as a paleontologist at some of the key sites you work in, and how that makes you think about the phenomenon of, of extinction and its importance. OK, thanks, Chris. Well, one of the things I probably get asked the most is, what on earth have fossils got to do with modern conservation? They're all dead. 
yes, they are very dead. However, as a paleontologist, I think I have a different perspective. I'm used to looking back a long time. And when I look back, what I see is a very different Australia to what we have now. I see an Australia with an incredibly biodiverse fauna. And I also see an Australia which sadly doesn't have, uh, now doesn't have animals around that I'm constantly digging up in caves at, at Narracourt and other places. So there are two great waves of extinction that I study in the last half a million years. The first being the megafauna extinction at about 45,000 years ago when we lost our big iconic marsupials such as Diprotodon and Thylacoleo. And sometimes I feel I don't really know those animals. I never got to see one and I never will, unfortunately. We've been able to bring some of them to life with art. But perhaps I feel more emotionally connected to the next wave of extinction following European settlement because they're animals that I do feel very close to. So when we're excavating fossil deposits and one of our key sites for University of Adelaide is Narracourt Caves. Uh, you'll have to, if I start on Narracourt Caves, Chris, you'll probably have to well, How many stop people me. have, have been to Narracourt <laughs> Caves to see that? That's a great oh, showing. So proud. Great showing, yeah. Let the record state it's a lot of people. That's great, yeah. So as, you, as you know, Narracourt Caves is South Australia's only World Heritage Area, so it's very significant and it's World Heritage listed because it has such an amazing record of, of mammals. It's this one of the Australian fossil mammal sites with Riversley in Queensland. And I went there as an undergraduate student and it really was love at first cave for me. It wasn't because it was caves. What struck me was that these caves had collected underground archives of lost worlds. And that was amazing to me that if I was diligent enough and observant enough and careful enough, I could look at these big piles of dirt in the bottom of caves and I could tease out the climate, the environment, the vegetation and the animals that used to live here and not just for a few thousand years but for Narracourt, half a million years and look at all of the climate change and fauna relationships to that over time and that was really magical to me. So the work that we're doing now is really reconstructing lost biodiversity. And one of the things I think we've lost in Australia in some places is what is the sort of core function of the ecosystem? What, uh, from the mammals that we've lost, how do we know how they interacted and how they were distributed? And we know that, as Chris said, the surface of the earth has changed a lot because of us. So a lot of these mammals are all just dressed up with nowhere to go. They can't move around like they used to move around. So the fossil record gives us perspective on where these animals once roamed and that may help us conserve them into the future. So yes, it is actually important to look at the dead ones too, the really dead ones, <laughs> for conservation. One of the uh, examples that comes to my mind a lot when I think about uh, issues in South Australia, and, we, and I'm sure we'll come back to this plenty, um, is the distribution of the koala. Uh, because, you know, it's often said, correctly in some way, that the, uh, that the koala has been you know, reintroduced to much of, of a, this part of Australia, to the Mount Lofty Ranges, the hills, to Kangaroo Island. Um, but if you look back in the fossil record, uh, you don't have to go very far back, just to, uh, the dates aren't entirely clear, but uh, well within the uh, occupation by, of this continent by people, that koalas were to be found all the way to the southwest corner of, south, of, of Western Australia. And so, um, again, that's, we're talking about a time span of, of people being here on the continent. And so these distributions have changed over time. And so in that, in that context, uh, these places like Kangaroo Island that have koalas now are very much part of of the natural distribution in that view. Uh, go, where do we set it? Do we only strictly view the natural distribution of animals as how they were when uh, Europeans first arrived? Well, surely not. So uh, your work gives us this deeper perspective of understanding what really is natural. Where do animals yeah. belong? Absolutely, and I think we, we need to convert everyone to paleontologists because it will give you that perspective to see Funnily enough, Australia has only had state borders for a few <laughs> short decades, 100 years. Uh, it, it used to be one great big environment that animals moved around and were distri distributed according to resources and climate. 
and you know, in some cases they just can't do that now. But it's really useful for us through the fossil record to be able to see what, what is normal, what is natural. And uh, what we're seeing today with distributions, looking at a decimated environment in many places, are we looking at where things can hang on rather than where they actually would prefer to be? And it helps to think, as we might later in the discussion, about where things may move as uh, habitats and environments do keep changing. I want to bring in this side of our uh, panel as well. Uh, when we think about some of the threatening processes, the things that uh, really cause endangerment in Australia's mammals, um, traditionally, we've thought about two main ones. One is um, habitat modification, the way that uh, people have come in and, and changed the landscape. And that turns out to be, in most parts of the world, the most important way that mammals are threatened. Uh, but also aspects like direct exploitation, hunting and removing of animals, et cetera. Um, those, those globally are, are two of the biggest concerns. What we're seeing now is an increasing concern on issues that, that uh, might be intuitive and, and in front of us, like climate change. But also, especially in Australia in recent years, things that are less, perhaps intuitive, less predictable, like disease. And Chelsea, you're working on one of the strangest diseases in all of biology, uh, which is uh, the disease that's afflicting Tasmanian devils, devil facial tumor disease. Those, uh, I saw a lot of hands raised. A lot of people are, are somewhat familiar with this. At its core, this is one of the strangest biologies out there. It is a contagious cancer. It's a cancer that arose in one devil in the mid-1990s, a female devil, 1995, 1996, and has spread like you might spread a virus or a infection from devil to devil ever since. This is a very unusual way that cancer would operate. Sort of if, if we have medical doctors here in med school, you know, you learn that it's axiomatic that cancer is born of the self. Not this one. This is a cancer that can be transmitted between individuals. And um, I'm going to turn it to Chelsea to tell us a little more about how that strange biology works, but also specifically how she's studying. How are you studying it? Talk to us. Thank you, Chris. Can you hear, can everyone hear me? Yep. All right. <laughs> So, yes, as, as you mentioned, uh, the Tasmanian devil uh, is endangered uh, due to the emergence of devil facial tumour. Uh, so, devil facial tumour is both aggressive and transmissible. And the fact that it's transmissible is very unique. It's only one of three known. Uh, naturally occurring transmissible cancers uh, in the wild uh, that, we, that we currently know of. Uh, the other two are a sexually transmitted cancer in dogs uh, known as K9 transmissible venereal tumour and the second is a leukaemia-like cancer in soft-shelled clams. So uh, quite a variety of uh, differences there. But devil facial tumour out of the three is by far the most deadly. Uh, if an individual is infected with the cancer, it is unlikely to survive any longer than three to six months. And uh, generally, it's usually due to starvation as the cancer is in the facial region. But if this doesn't occur, uh, devil facial tumour is highly metastatic. So if it's not starvation, the, the individual will die of organ failure. And the, the way that the cancer is transmitted to each other, uh, devils are generally solitary animals, but when they, they feed and, and they scavenge, they come together and they can be quite aggressive and uh, they bite each other. And so feeding interactions and also uh, during uh, mating interactions, so the alpha males and the alpha females are primarily uh, affected by this. Uh, so when they bite each other, they are essentially inoculating the cancer cells directly into the blood, uh, bloodstream of um, the next devil. Uh, and as uh, Chris mentioned, um, that there are other cancers that can be uh, sort of transferred, but generally it's due to a pathogen or a virus. That's what's being transferred and then that is what causes the cancer. But in the devils, it is the clonal cell line itself being transferred between individuals. And we know that this cancer is derived from uh, the primary glial cell of the peripheral nervous system called the Schwann cell. And it's, it's very interesting that 
the, the Schwann cell has uh, gone on to become this malignant transmissible cancer. The, the, the primary role of a Schwann cell is generally to just provide uh, so, uh, insulation and repair to the peripheral nerves, uh, but in this case, uh, it's sort of gone a bit funky and and uh, gone on to tra and transfer. But we don't generally know how this actually happened. We know we, we're we're learning more and more um, as uh, time goes on. Uh, it's it's quite a relatively young cancer, canine transmissible venereal tumor. It's between five to three thousand years old, uh, whereas devil facial tumor is um, only almost almost um, two decades old now. Um, but uh, as we go along, we're, we're learning more and more. But we still haven't answered the question as to how how did this happen in the first place. But and, and the, the means that it, um, the way that it is transferred uh, is because it evades the immune system of the host devil. Uh, it does this because uh, there is an um, important immune genes called the major histocompatibility complex genes. These are down-regulated in the devil. Initially, it was thought because of the lack of genetic diversity and that they're down-regulated that this was the cause, but it's actually the cancer cells themselves have evolved to be able to downregulate these genes. So it's, it's like they're masking themselves from the immune system. And uh, the, the host devil uh, immune system sees these cancer cells as self. So... And if, if I could say, that's, yeah. that's why this is uh, usually not seen. The, the, way, the, the reason that I uh, couldn't get cancer from interacting with someone else is because typically the immune system would notice it right away as non-self, it would be a non-starter. That's why it's so unusual. But in devils, yeah. this, this cancer has evaded that. Mm, yeah, so these, th those MHC genes play a large role in organ transplants and um, skin grafts. Uh, and, and generally, uh, if, if you have a foreign substance, they will reject it, but not in the case of devil facial tumor. So, a, a, a way that would be really good to learn more about devil face tumour and hopefully answer these questions would to be able to uh, acquire a healthy Schwann cell line for comparative studies. And there are ways to isolate the primary Schwann cells from the peripheral nerves. And it can be done, but it's very difficult. There is challenges with actually culturing uh, up these cells uh, with... Um, there's a lot of contamination with uh, other types of cells getting in there and having the cells grow for extended periods of time uh, it can be um, quite challenging. So my work comes in at this stage. Mm. We're trying to find an alternative. And uh, it's my, my project's an interdisciplinary project between the School of Animal and Veterinary Sciences and the School of Medicine. And it emerged because we learnt about some of the work that's being um, carried out at the University of Adelaide School of Medicine where in the stroke research group they are utilising stem cells, in particular dental pulp stem cells, so the population of stem cells within the pulp tissue of the tooth. These have uh, the ability to differentiate or turn into cells of the nervous system, uh, in particular Schwann cells. So we are aiming to utilise the same techniques and the stem cells from the teeth of the Tasmanian devil, in particular we're looking at the canine teeth because it has a lot more pulp tissue and a lot more stem cells there mm -hmm. and we're aiming to uh, replicate, replicate the same thing and create um, Schwann cells from um, the, the stem cells in the devil. Ultimately, wanting to then compare with the devil facial tumour cells and see if we can answer those questions. And there's the potential for coming up with subclinical diagnostics, uh, being able to take a blood test and being able to diagnose the cancer before the tumours really uh, get aggressive. Uh, so that's sort of what I'm doing at the moment. That's exciting work. So basically, yeah, part of it is um, trying to develop that important system for actually being able to study Schwann cells in the laboratory setting then, yeah. So 
uh, you know, the Tasmanian devil cancer has, has just, uh, you know, absolutely grabbed a hold of my attention from day one. And, you know, it requires these really clever ways to try to, you know, piece out what's happening, piece together what's happening, and, and then, uh, you know, how to take steps to solve it. But, you know, at its, at its fundament, you know, thinking about a contagious cancer, do we want to know more about how a cancer becomes contagious, spreads between individuals? Absolutely, and this is one of our only model systems for, for doing that. Before I move to Wayne, who has a, a veterinary and medical background as well, Chelsea, what do you think about, uh, you know, what, what might you learn that from, from the devils that might also be helpful for understanding human health? Well, although my work is primarily utilizing the medical uh, human medical techniques to apply to animals. Uh, there's certainly uh, uh, the potential for us as soon as we learn more about devil facial tumour, uh, we can potentially apply that to peripheral nerve sheath, tu nerve sheath tumours in humans. And then also just the, the, the transmissible nature of this cancer. It's, it's fascinating because, I mean, for all we know, there may be a cancer of humans that may have the ability to evade the immune system, but we just don't interact the same way that the devils do. It's very unlikely that I'm going to just randomly bite you <laughs> on, uh, on the not. side of the street. <laughs> um, but the more we know, the more that we can potentially apply uh, yeah. later on. That's right. And so, what, I mean, what Chelsea's doing here is, you know, taking cutting-edge techniques from uh, human biomedicine, applying them to animals, and maybe coming back uh, from animals to humans with insights that are really uh, fundamentally important. I think it really highlights the importance of the interdisciplinary and bring, bringing together multiple disciplines to sort of come up with these serendipitous uh, projects because if we were all to stay in our individual fields, it really narrows down um, ideas and yeah, I think that that's one thing that I, like, I would like to highlight with my research, the ability for people to come together and brainstorm and yeah, answer questions. That's brilliant, that's brilliant. When, uh, when I was a PhD student here, one of my advisors was um, a scientist, Professor Russ Baudinet. He did all kinds of things with mammals. One of them was uh, you know, putting, putting uh, animals onto treadmills like wallabies. In this animal room, we'd have all kinds of Australian mammals. It'd be wallabies and wombats and all kinds of things in the animal room. And I remember as he was reaching the end of his life, uh, someone asked him what I just asked Chelsea, which was, this is all very interesting, but you know, what, you know, how is this going to help us understand human biology? And he's got all the wallabies on the treadmills. And he, I think you remember him saying to them, well, I just, I just hope we uh, learn something that can help the animals. And, uh, you know, that's, uh, I thought that was a brilliant answer. And uh, that's uh, often, often, you know, forgive my question, often that's what, what society wants to know. Why are we doing this work? And what can we learn about uh, how it's going to help us? There may be very important things there, but also we're in it for the animals. Yeah, sure. So, Wayne, um, you're coming from a veterinary and medical background uh, as well. Um, I hope you might talk to us a little bit about koalas because it's a, it's a, a topic we've had a lot of kind of uh, public interest and discussion in. Uh, and maybe, maybe move from uh, Chelsea's talking about disease to moving into the same realm for koalas. What, what's going on with research into koala health and medicine? What insights does it give us to, to humans and how can we help the koalas as well? Well, uh, ko koalas are, 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 are really uh, interesting species in the fact that there's, they are declining at a, a, a rapid rate and certainly uh, deforestation and, and vehicle accidents and so on have, are playing a big part. But um, disease has, come, uh, has become part of the mix, like, like, like we talked about before, that disease is an unusual um, uh, thing that affects the the population of di different species. Um, normally ecologists used to think of them as being, you know, diseases as just being a, a thing that happened. But actually nowadays we know that uh, diseases can play a big part on the survivability of lots of species. Koalas in particular are um, susceptible to uh, several diseases. We, we, as part of our ko koala research group here at the University of of Adelaide, we've been able to look at some of the diseases that have been occurring in, in our neck of the woods. 
which has been, was originally stimulated by some of the interesting cases that were occurring in the eastern states. So we've got several diseases, ret retrovirus, koala retrovirus disease, which is a, an absolutely remarkable virus, a retrovirus. A, so retroviruses are like a hu human immunodeficiency virus, and each of our genomes um, have around about 8% uh, retrovirus uh, sort of lost um, ability to, to cause disease. But we, we've, the, the whole idea about uh, retroviruses is that they become a, in, in jo joined into the, um, to the genome. And so that's been happening with, with koalas as well. So in Can I clarify that for a second? This is an am another, like the devil, this is an amazing aspect of the biology of mammals, which is that if you sequence their genomes, human or koala, you find that something like 8 to 12 percent of mammal genomes are not actually mammalian at all. They are pieces of viruses that once infected us and became, over time, part of our genomes. Um, so there's sort of these foreign elements inside the genome, many of which probably do important things, but we don't know very much about it. Well, they, they've become benign, really. They're mm. just junk uh, DNA, but not, not the case with uh, the koalas because they, the, the retrovirus is being uh, taken up into the, the genome. So in the eastern states, uh, we see this, um, this a process which is called endogenization, where, they, where the, the virus has been taken into the genome. So in, in the eastern states, we see koalas that have 100% infection uh, with the retrovirus. Uh, is that causing a problem? Uh, we think it probably is. Um, in South Australia, we have probably, and, and this is where it's been very interesting, there's some of the work that um, we've been uh, looking into, is that, that the virus might well be partly becoming endogenized, being taken into the genome, but the, some of the um, uh, population might be, uh, have ex exogenous uh, viral infections. So, so we're seeing, um, with, in the eastern states, we're seeing the virus ca causing uh, lymphatic type uh, diseases. Uh, one of the types of koala retrovirus, ko koala retrovirus B, is now associated w and believed to be immunosuppressive. And so we're seeing, in the eastern states, around about 90% of the koalas are infected with chlamydia which is um, a disease that is, again, another disease that we're seeing with koalas. It's, it, it's not related to the, the human chlamydia, but it does cause similar sorts of disease, uh, ocular infection, re reproductive infection, and, and urinary tract infection. It really makes those animals suffer. Yeah. And it makes them uh, yeah, terribly, uh, suffer terribly. And so we see very high levels. We see lots and lots of disease in the eastern states. We see this background of retrovirus uh, as well. In South Australia, we see a very different picture. So we're seeing much less uh, prevalence of uh, retrovirus. We're not seeing it as, as yet any of the koala retrovirus B. And with the chlamydia, we're seeing much lower uh, rate of chlamydia disease. So we're seeing Within uh, the Mount Lofty Ranges, about 47% of the koalas do have chlamydia infection, but we're only seeing around about 3 or 4% of them with uh, clinical disease, which is a very different uh, manifestation to the eastern states. And one of the really interesting things that's just occurred, or, or that we've been able to work out through um, Jess Fabian's uh, PhD research, is that uh, Kangaroo Island uh, is actually uh, free of chlamydia disease. It, they, there, are, there is koala retrovirus over there, but we, it's free of chlamydia disease. So with all the um, research that's been done, uh, looking at the samples that we've been taking from the Kangaroo Island uh, koalas, plus also looking at the, uh, those animals that have been sterilized over the past um, 20 years or so, um, that, that we found a you know, 13,000 animals have been, uh, uh, have been sterilized, and there's not been any signs of the disease. So we're seeing real problems in the eastern states. Koalas' uh, habitat is decreasing. The, just, just today, there was something in the press about 75 hectares being 
um, being earmarked for development, which is good koala habitat just outside Brisbane. And so if this continues, and, and with this background of the disease that we see in the eastern states, um, then it might be that the South Australian koala has become a really important part of the, the population. And certainly with uh, chlamydia being free uh, or, or not being seen in uh, Kangaroo Island, then even though the, the, the population is, is relatively inbred in, in uh, genetic terms, they are free of the, the disease. And so they might well be a really important population in the future uh, to help with the uh, management of this species over the next you know, 20, 30, 50 years or so. I think that's, that's important to remember. I mean, if you remember some of the history of, of koalas in this state, koala, ko koalas occurred naturally down in the southeast, became extinct uh, at a time in the early 20th century when koalas were declining everywhere. Um, there was a, a concern in the 1920s that koalas, kind of like now, the concern picking up again, koalas would be declining and could even become extinct. Back then, the threats were different. Uh, there was a lot of hunting for the fur trade of koala, which seems you know, yeah. very unthinkable now. But uh, some, the, stag the statistics are kind of staggering. Um, there are a couple years where if you compile all the records, it looks like more than a million koalas were being exported out of Australia annually uh, for, the, for a global fur industry, which is kind of extraordinary. So, this bringing uh, koalas to Kangaroo Island and later to the Mount Lofty Ranges was sort of as an insurance population. Now, it's been all too successful, as, as, as we know, but uh, um, history has a tendency to repeat itself sometimes, especially in conservation. And uh, right now, again, we're worried about the massive decline of uh, Australian koalas in the east, and it may be that uh, some of these uh, animals that have ended up over here in South Australia are the answer to protecting koalas. Yeah, so it, it might be that we need to love our koalas a little bit more because they might be really important in the future. And certainly we have large numbers of koalas in the, the Mount Lofties and Kangaroo Island. And it, it, we do have a background of disease and we do see sarcoptic mange and we do see some uh, problems with a, a kidney disease called oxalate nephrosis. But um, really we need to maybe think what we're going to do in the future and um, you know, maybe we need to care a little bit more about our koalas even though their income is uh, relatively recently but they've been here a long time before that. Well time always goes really quickly in these conversations and we've gotten to that time where we really should open up uh, to the audience for questions, and I know there will be a lot. I was going to ask Wayne a little bit more about some of our bats and uh, other questions amongst the audience here, but I'm going to see if, if some of these emerge organically from, from the audience. Uh, when we do take questions, because um, we may have folks that are hearing impaired and we have a radio audience, um, when you raise your hand, please do wait for the microphone. Don't, don't shout out. Not everyone will be able to hear you. So let's wait for the microphone uh, if you do have a question. Bob over here will be scanning the audience here. And please feel free. Feel free to ask anything you want about what we've discussed or any aspects of mammals at all. Uh, good evening. Thanks for the talk. I was wondering with the fruit bats, would they be here without white settlement? Sorry, can you repeat that? <laughs> would fruit bats be in Adelaide if it wasn't for the white settlement here? I think that's a, an interesting uh, uh, question and an a, a interesting uh, aspect. I think it p probably uh, might well have uh, something to do with uh, white settlement because certainly they've um, a, a ranged, uh, th they're expanding their range. Uh, it's uh, a natural uh, movement of flying foxes into uh, Adelaide um, and they started around about 2010 uh, and now the population is around about um, 28 to 30,000. It tends to wax and wane a little bit so in, in winter we seem to see more bats coming in from the eastern states and, and in summer they ten, tend to, uh, some of them disappear. But we have this um, all, all year um, a population and it might well be that in the f not too distant future that we might see some of the um, the population splinter off and there might be more camps 
uh, in around South Australia. Uh, why did they come over to uh, South Australia? Well, it's almost certainly because they were um, starved of resources in some way, and so they've made the journey. It always uh, seems remarkable to me that some bats suddenly made a decision that they were going to go west uh, to look for some food, and uh, lo and behold, in, in Adelaide, they found um, great um, food supplies. And it is... Uh, and, and the food that they are eating is uh, transplanted uh, trees. So um, often it's uh, uh, spotted gum, blue gum, uh, lemon-scented gum, some of the ficus species that they, we find here. We, we are finding the bats spend a lot of time on streets uh, and in the backyards of, of properties, and we have uh, planted a lot of these uh, trees, and we supply them with uh, water, irrigate them often. So particularly in winter, at this time of the year, we're seeing uh, quite a lot of flowering of gums, and they, that's their main food source. The nectar um, is really important, and so they, they're uh, keyed in to um, feeding on these plants. And, and it might well be that because we have um, settled in Adelaide, we've planted uh, trees that are exotic to South Australia, that it might well be that uh, they have found a food source that they needed to look for, and it means that they, it's, maybe the food source is declining in some parts of the eastern states, and, and so they're uh, moving over here. So even though the population is really struggling, generally speaking, right across its range, we've uh, welcomed uh, a fantastic addition to the Adelaide landscape. Hmm. I, we have to take other questions. I will answer that quickly, too, because I've studied, my own research has studied in detail the evolution of flying foxes as a group for much of my career. Um, it is a quintessentially Australian lineage of bats. Um, it, it occurs out through the Indian Ocean and into places like India, but uh, the core realm of the evolution of flying foxes is in the Pacific and includes Australia. And so for millions of years, we've had these incredible, unusual bats um, occupying all kinds of roles in Australian ecosystems. And um, in, in particular, we see, looking with sort of Liz's deep, deep time perspective, we see that these bats come and go from different places at different times. Um, before these uh, gray-headed flying foxes arrived here and took up residence in Adelaide, we'd have occasional visitors of other species, like little red flying foxes. These are powerful flyers. So an individual animal, like a migrating bird, you know, can, can fly across half the continent, can fly, some of, these, some of these individual bats can fly to different parts of Indonesia, Malaysia, come back to the Australian coast. So um, they're able to cover a lot of ground looking for the best area, and they're naturally going to disperse to wherever they can, can find. It's also perhaps a climate change story. As temperatures change and winters change and seasons change, there will be more places where um, bats can live further to the south than before, perhaps. Other questions? Um, great talks, thanks. Helen Marshall from um, the Adelaide Medical School um, and Robinson Research Institute. I just had a question for Chelsea. Um, do the tumours only grow on the face? So, for example, is there something about the host uh, or the anatomy in that if bites occur on the back or the legs, do tumours grow? And do you know what the risk factors are? Very good question. Um, no, they, they can grow elsewhere. So it's just, just the, when they interact with each other, it's generally in the facial region. I guess if you, even when sort of dogs sort of have a bit of a scrap as well, they, they use their teeth. So it's generally in the facial region. Um, uh, my supervisor, uh, Dr. Stephen Pycroft, who's in the audience today as well, uh, he was on, um, uh, led the team that sort of did the initial diagnosis of it and they came across cases where you could specifically see where the tooth marks were, where the tumours started to grow. So, and, and there have been cases where, uh, rare because they don't bite each other in like the hind, but, but there has been documented, yeah. Good evening. Uh, I come from North America, actually Canada, and uh, my degree was in wildlife management, which uh, has the concept of 
habitat, uh, what do you call it, li limited habitat. In other words, the habitat will control the species. And it's all very well to say you have kangaroos, not kangaroos, but the koalas on KI and uh, understand their biology. But you've got to look at the holding capacity of the particular habitats as well, which are, are becoming very limited. And a lot of those are on private property and managed by farmers, and the trees are getting damaged. Now, what's your understanding of culling as a means of managing a population? Um, let me say a word. It seems like Wayne does as well, and anyone who wants to jump in. Uh, yeah, I think that uh, over-browsing is a big problem when koalas become overabundant, and we're facing that issue and have been, you know, at times uh, it, it, in South Australia. Um, but the, specifically culling, that's a really tricky one, right? And that's because, you know, at the start, as I said, uh, you know, you, sir, came, come from North America like I do, and you know that, you know, uh, the koalas have a resonance with, with everyone outside of Australia as well as in. And so, um, so that's a difficult prospect. It's, it might simply not be uh, a management tool on the table for political or societal reasons. That might be the case. So um, culling is tough, and it might be that as a wildlife manager, one has to just say, uh, this is not going to be a viable uh, way to control koalas because of public opinion. That's one possibility, and that's an important one to consider. Just like, for example, other iconic mammals, like elephants is an interesting example. In, in Africa, you have places where, most places where elephants are um, having a very hard time where they're disappearing at great rates, they're becoming extinct in much of their range, uh, but you have a few places, strongholds, mainly in the south, where there are too many elephants. Uh, but culling is just not a politically viable uh, strategy. There's a lot of other examples like that, too. So, um, I mean, Wayne wants to speak, and we can hear from anyone else, but, uh, uh, you know, I have a background in wildlife management as well, and I uh, am not particularly squeamish about some of these options, but some of them are my might just simply not be palatable. It might not, we have to consider other options. Wayne? Uh, I, I agree, uh, Chris, it, it, it's all about palatability, um, what is an accepted norm these days, and certainly within the Australian context, uh, the idea of culling species like koalas uh, is uh, very hard to swallow. Um, from a, from a you know, North American, Canadian, uh, South African sp perspective, you know, the, the uh, idea of, of culling and controlling is is uh, commonly practiced, except in with elephants in around about the middle 1990s. Then elephants were, were they, they stopped culling the elephants in Kruger National Park, and the numbers have, have massively increased, and that has led to huge damage in Kruger National Park. Going back to South Australia with koalas, is it, it's uh, enshrined in law that we can't cull. Um, uh, koalas in South Australia, but maybe we can uh, try and control some of the populations by using contraceptives, and that's being looked at at the moment. It's not an ideal sort of situation, but um, given the fact that we can't cull in South Australia, and we do know that there is over-browsing uh, that is occurring on Kangaroo Island and, and in the Mount Lofty Rages, uh, then we need to think about other alternatives, and that might be one that might well work um, in, in these, a consistent in, effort. In these situations, there are often just no easy answers. One, one of the ways forward might uh, most importantly be to think more nationally about koalas. We have these different pieces of the puzzle, like I talked about with elephants. Similarly, here in Australia, we have places where uh, koalas are in very bad shape, and we have places like South Australia where they're doing great and, uh, and where there are extra um, interesting biological properties like they don't have some of these problematic diseases. So some of the way forward may be uh, trying to think cleverly with, with the other states about um, a more national management system where we can think about moving koalas, but it's not that simple just to start moving them. Anyway, Liz, did you have any thoughts on um, change through time or any aspect? My thoughts are probably, again, a bit strange. Um, because of my perspective, but I actually do touch on what you just said. I think we need to start thinking about these species nationally. We tend to think about them being a pest in one area and, and rare in the other. <clears throat> We've got eastern grey kangaroos. I live at Narracourt, and you go across the border and 
it's uh, open season and uh, they're rare and they're rare at, in South Australia it seems kind of crazy to me but when you look at the fossil record and the work we do at Narra Court is tracking species and biodiversity over time and one of the things we see is that some animals are incredibly resilient to change and some aren't but even those that are incredibly resilient can change depending on the conditions and one of the lessons we've learned is from looking at some of particularly our small species, our critical weight range mammals, under two and a half kilograms, that some of the most common species, and we literally dig these out by the bucket loads at Narracourt, were some of the first to go extinct after European settlement. So when I think of, you know, these animals are literally hanging on where we allow them to, and some of them have done very well, and they've become very prevalent in some areas, but I guess the problem is some of those areas are just the size of your average decent bushfire and they can be wiped out in one hit. We've got species that are existing in a park that can be totally destroyed by fire at any minute. So I think maybe a more uh, broader view with bringing in some of the, the power of the paleontological record, which does help us understand distributions and, and natural communities might be um, you know, beneficial. I'm certainly trying to sell the paleo record here. Oh, ab <laughs> absolutely. Uh, before we move to the next question, I just Liz mentioning that um, made me realize that we've we've sort of been uh, uh, we need to call out uh, one of the other main threatening processes if we're going to talk about mammals at all. We're almost to the end of our evening, but I talked about habitat destruction and I talked about um, direct. Um, um, utilizing like hunting or, or you know, removing animals in that way. And I, we also talked about disease. But I think uh, in the modern European era, it's been invasive species that really is uh, one of the most, uh, really the most important thorny problem for managing and protecting and conserving mammals in what Liz is calling this critical weight range. So we haven't talked about that yet tonight, but that really is uh, um, the thorn in our side of a lot of issues with, you know, how are we going to long term uh, take some of these endangered mammals off of life support? These ones that are so common in the fossil record, but that we're struggling to keep hold of if we haven't lost them already today. One more question Bob's telling us. I'd like to ask um, Chelsea a question. Uh, I was interested in the um, research you're doing with stem cells, with uh, tooth pulp. Uh, I wondered whether you've come across another um, uh, mammal who's involved with um, a disease from um, tooth um, uh, gums, and that is hominids. And the, I wondered if you'd come across um, Porphyromonas gingivalis, which is um, a, a bug that grows in um, people uh, who have plaque, deep plaque with um, gum retracement. And that can interfere because it passes the blood-brain barrier with glial cells. And as you know, they're the, the shepherds of the neurons. And if they're not doing a good job and they also um, can pass the um, blood-brain barrier. So it's associated with a lot of neurogenerative and degenerative uh, processes. Have you come across that? I haven't, no. It so would that's be worth following yeah, up, Yeah, absolutely. Mm. That's a very interesting point. Um, uh, just as a matter of interest, the Porphyromonas um, is seen in koalas. Um, we've been doing some work looking at the uh, some of the dental issues um, with um, Koalas, but also the the Porphyromonas is seen in um, other uh, marsupials that get a, a disease called lumpy, lumpy uh, jaw or oral necrobacillosis, and Porphyromonas plays a big part uh, in that. Um, so there's there's some interesting uh, connections with the the human side, and we're working with a, a, a dentist who's been working on uh, Porphyromonas gingivalis up in Queensland as well. Thanks. It's actually really interesting because I've been thinking about the koala recently because the Tasmanian devil so far is the only uh, marsupial to have had uh, the, the stem cells in the teeth being investigated so far. 
uh, and we've actually found some sort of differences in morphology to what has already been uh, looked at in humans and uh, other rodents and mammals. Um, they've, they've also looked in dogs and yeah, the, the morphology is very different so I was wondering if it could be a marsupial thing potentially so um, people maybe might look into koalas at some point. <laughs> New frontier, yeah. Okay, I think we'll call a uh, halt to things there. Could you please join me in thanking our speakers, Chris Helgen, Liz Reed, Chelsea Graham and Wayne Boardman. Uh, we do have gifts for the speakers, but I won't put you through that. <laughs> I'll give them to them later. Uh, that concludes this evening's event. Thank you for all of you for coming out. It's a great crowd. And it's really uh, impressive to see the support for Research Tuesdays. We'll be back on the 10th of September for our three-minute thesis final. The three-minute thesis is a very popular event because it provides an opportunity for our audience to hear from our, uh, 10 of our best PhD students. If you would like to come along, make sure you register early. It's a very popular event. So thank you all again for coming out tonight. Uh, good night.